Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Video Analytics 101 podcast. Today, I have the great pleasure to interview Dr. Jerome Pascaro. He's currently working at SAMA in Montreal, but I'm going to let, uh, let him introduce himself in a second. Um, welcome, Jerome. Thank you for joining the podcast. Hey, I'm uh, really happy to be uh, here, and thanks for the invite, uh, Flo. Um, yeah, absolutely. Uh, that's super interesting because you are uh, working in the field of of AI for quite some time, different uh, different uh, positions. Um, lately, I believe more in machine learning and um, probably data labeling. But we'll get into all of this. Maybe you can start us off uh, with a little bit of your background. How did you get here? Um, what interests you in this field? So how did you get to this point where we are today? Yeah, sure. So um, I'm an electrical engineer uh, by training. And I did pretty much like a, the classic uh, um, training in, uh, in uh, EE. Uh, and then around uh, 2000, 2001, uh, I get introduced to, to AI. So uh, I'm not as young as I, I look, right? And uh, from that point on, it was uh, uh, it, it, it was a, it became a love story. Now back uh, back then, um, you know, there was no concept of deep neural network. We were just studying like kind of neural networks uh, and uh, reinforcement learning. Uh, I think the book that we were using back then was the, the Russell and Norvig book, which is, I think is still relevant today. I, and uh, for a little while, I kind of stopped doing AI and um, did, um, or my, my interest in, in AI kind of faded a little bit. And I, I, I went on to do a, a master's and PhD in, in a field called haptics, uh, which is uh, which is a sense of touch uh, with computers, which I thought was really fascinating, right? Uh, and um, I'm sorry, can you, can you tell us a little bit more about this? What is it about? Oh, yeah, of course. So you know how, like in vision, we're trying to reproduce uh, visual sensations through screens, or today through like uh, VR machines. Well, uh, haptics is kind of a similar field for, for a different sense, which is the sense of touch. So how can we capture and then reproduce tactile sensations? Uh, and then the uh, applications are endless. Like if you can reproduce the, and 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 control uh, what people are feeling, because the sense of touch is usually through um, the, the 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 skin organ. Um, you could think of like money. I'm sure many applications of how that would be uh, helpful. Haptics today exist. Like you know, you have simple vibrations in uh, your cell phone. Mm -hmm. For instance, or um, there's also haptic feedback in like really advanced uh, sur surgical uh, training systems, uh, but it's still limited compared to uh, where vision is at uh, these days with, uh, you know, the proliferation of, of screens and, and like, as I said, the VR, VR systems. Okay. Wow. Very cool. Nice. Yeah. Um, so I ended up doing haptics and, and, you know, what the interesting part about this is I actually think that at some point. If it hasn't started yet, like the fields of of haptics and AI are, are going to converge, mm -hmm. uh, just because it's extremely complex to reproduce tactile sensations. Well, first of all, to capture and understand them, and then to reproduce them. That uh, at some point, uh, I can think of you know generative AI approaches, for instance, for uh, reproducing um, any type of uh, sensation that uh, humans are capable of of feeling uh, through their skin. Yeah. Well, I mean. AI by itself is, is a enabling technology, right? And haptics could one application, one one field where you can apply AI to make it better, I guess. Exactly. Yeah. Okay, cool. Okay, so um then what happened? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, then what happened? So um around 2017 in Montreal, um there was uh, we were starting to be the center for uh, for, for AI in, in North America, mm -hmm. one of the, the centers. And um a company was founded, which uh, founded, which um, really got me excited. It was called Element AI back then, mm -hmm. and uh, I did everything I could just to join at the very early, uh, early stages. Uh, I was actually one of the well, the first uh, <laughs> product manager over there. I believe they didn't even have that title, so uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> they hired me as a project manager. And um, the idea was to, um, like you said, enable uh, a, a number of uh, industries uh, through AI. So there, there. It, the, the timing was uh, was right, uh, and it was a very exciting time because uh, we were seeing in the in the academia tons of successes uh, uh, with uh, the, the modern AI approaches and the deep learning mm -hmm. approaches. Um, I spent four or five years uh, over there. Now the company ended up being acquired by um, a tech giant in California, ServiceNow, 
And uh, no, I'd say that it was a mixed uh, success, uh, but I did learn uh, tons about what AI is capable of doing and, and most importantly, what uh, it's not capable of doing, uh, at least today, uh, uh, you know, because timing is, is everything. Um, so um, can you... Can you tell us a little bit about the fields that you were working on? Was it also computer vision or, or something other, other applications? Mm -hmm. So <laughs> I ended up actually kickstarting a time series team. I right. kickstarted, uh, yeah, coming to a computer vision uh, team as well. One of the things that we were trying to do is uh, entity extraction from, uh, from documents. Uh, so mm -hmm. think of like uh, any type of uh, written document, uh, whether handwritten or, um, you know, PDFs, for instance, uh, uh, digitized already. Um, and how could we actually extract all the information on these documents automatically using AI? Of course, there's a component that was uh, OCR, so uh, optical character recognition for the handwritten stuff, uh, or uh, a component that was more around like uh, how to identify what the important entities in those documents are and classify them uh, uh, so we did that for industries such as the insurance industries, uh, industry and, and a number of others. Uh, today, I, I, I believe that product has evolved a lot uh, and, and ServiceNow offers it as a part of its suite of, uh, of products that, um, that, it, that it has on its uh, website. Wow. Okay. Very cool. I mean, the, the field uh, by, by its own insurance is huge and, and still still emerging. So I'm sure they didn't, uh, they didn't kill it. I mean, this is this yes. would be big. Yeah. Yeah, I think now the approach is a little uh, more agnostic to the uh, the end case because mm -hmm. um, you know you could think of like of a base layer that just extracts the entities and uh, understands the links between these entities on the uh, those forms of DOS documents, and then after that, what you do with them is a is a second step um, where you know you might uh, decide to. Uh, get back to the to, to the customer to ask for more details or classify that uh, that uh, the, the, the person who filled the the, the form in a certain category um, the, the, the number of applications is, is endless here oh okay cool uh, so, uh, so we did the time series we did computer vision and we did a number of other things too like uh, uh, we it was it was based on the on the idea that um, AI was as you you know started this conversation, could uh, influence or drive positively uh, uh, everything, basically. Yeah. And it was an, an enhancer. Yeah, OK, cool. Um, well, just a question asked before, I uh, wanted before. So if you're an electrical engineer, I guess you have a, a ring, right? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I we do have a ring for uh, if, okay. you, uh, if you graduate in electrical engineering. Yes. Okay. Well, that's pretty cool. We don't get it in Austria. But uh, <laughs> well, you get rings when you are finishing university. Um, yeah, the, okay, so yeah, okay. <laughs> sorry. The, the ring is supposed to be a reminder that um, that you, that being an engineer comes with a, a, a number of uh, responsibilities, right? Uh, and that the people's lives uh, might be at stake uh, when you're designing something, when you're building something. Yeah, well, I really like the sentiment. It's cool. Um, okay, so um, so you were at Element AI, and then you joined Sama, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so what do you do today? Yeah, so. Yeah. Once, you know, uh, Element AI was uh, acquired by ServiceNow, um, I decided that ServiceNow wasn't really um, uh, for me. Um, they do some very interesting things, <laughs> but it was uh, too big of a company for me. And I had come to the realization that um, models were becoming more kind of uh, table stakes themselves and they were becoming available mm -hmm. everywhere. Like you could download them from GitHub. So the real battle, the real competitive edge could be uh, gained uh, through the data itself, right? So I wanted mm -hmm. to get closer to the data. That was one of my objectives. Like I want to get closer to uh, ML data. Uh, and then also, um, I I was looking for a company that was really focused around using AI for something positive. A mm -hmm. And Sama checks both of these uh, boxes. Um, we do data annotation for all the biggest clients you can think of and the smaller clients as well, like uh, in computer vision. Uh, we, mm -hmm. we focus really on, on computer vision. Uh, and um, we're, we're, we're an impact focused social enterprise. So that means we have a double bottom line, right? Uh, one mm -hmm. of our mandate is really to provide uh, access to, to job opportunities yeah. for, for marginalized communities. Uh, more specifically in East Africa, so Uganda mm -hmm. and, uh, and in Kenya. 
Uh, but we also want to kind of set them up for long-term su success. So that means we hire our uh, people from, from over there, we train them, uh, and um, uh, we, uh, we get them to do some, some annotation work. Um, we focus on like purposeful hiring. Um, we, we try to, uh, as much as possible, target the most marginalized uh, communities to help them uh, the most. So, so in some cases, we actually need to really teach our new hires how to use a computer and a mouse. Mm -hmm. right? That's the, the, um, in, in other cases, we, we might hire people with um, uh, our higher level uh, skills. Um, and then once they gain access to the employment, our, our goal is really uh, to figure out how we can support them for, for continued development and, and growth. Hmm. Okay. Uh, so we're, we're, we're kind of structured as a bridge of employment, right? Um, so that's part of a, our business, a social impact business. But the, as I said, we're double bottom line. Today, we are a for-profit uh, uh, enterprise um, and uh, we need to uh, we need to make money, right? We need to have a growing revenue yeah. stream uh, and we need to provide value to to our clients. Uh, in uh, in the form of uh, of really valuable training data or um, techniques for uh, moderating and uh, uh, models and productions. Okay, and in general, you provide uh, data labeling services in computer vision for these clients. And uh, and you specifically, do you do uh, like project management or? What is it exactly? Yeah, so my title is a principal product uh, manager, and I, I also take care of a lot of the strategic uh, uh, initiatives that we have uh, and uh, the partnership, uh, at least on, on the tech side, the tech uh, partnerships, right? Um, the way the way I like, I like to think of it is like we have a, a core of a business that's been in existence for a long time, like data annotation for, for, for training, uh, for, for, for producing training data in computer vision, as you mentioned. But like, what else do we need to actually build around this uh, mm -hmm. to, you know, move up the uh, value uh, mm -hmm. ladder uh, for, for customers, right? Uh, it's not enough to just provide them with like uh, bounding boxes <laughs> and uh, polygons. Um, uh, that worked for a little while, but today our clients are asking for a lot more. So how can we leverage our annotating workforce and our operations and our uh, R&D, because we have a pretty solid R&D team as well, to uh, come up with new products and new solutions to uh, enhance uh, our, our clients' uh, business objectives. And, mm -hmm. and the best way we've found to do this today is to really help them uh, uh, increase the, the performance of their, their models and, and monitor their, their, their models, uh, the ones that are close to production or in production, to really decrease the, the risk of the, the risk, you know, whether it's in the form of a catastrophic failure. So imagine like if the model really uh, spits out something that it shouldn't, or, or just um, even lower, uh, lower grade uh, risk, which just uh, makes for a bad experience for, for their customers or their users uh, on, the, on the client side. Okay, so you also go into MLOps and, and really are in part of the operations of the business as well. Yeah, I think that's something we're really good at. Like we mm -hmm. we look at the thing as a we look at the problem as a holistic uh, a problem, but we also know our role within that uh, holistic uh, field because it's huge, right? Putting a model in production uh, and then I'm making sure that it has business impact and that, that the ROI is is positive is, is actually a very complex problem. We actually think that we can play a very important role in this just from focusing on the data that is used for training that model, but also on the, how to uh, validate that, that model and, and, and make sure that it uh, performs as uh, expected mm, Okay, cool. with a very data centric approach. Yeah. We're agnostic to the model itself most of the time because we recognize that that's the business of uh, or that's the expertise of our, of, our, uh, of our customers. They know their model better than anyone else. What they might not know as well as we do is the data because we look at every single image, every single video, every single 3D point cloud that they send us. Uh, and there's tons of information in there that they've missed and that their models have missed as, as well. Well, and, and also, like you said in the beginning, that models and architectures are pretty much commoditized anyway. So it's pretty likely that you use some kind of version of YOLO, but the big differentiator is really in the data or in the application, uh, what you do with it. That's exactly it. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. So you're in the right business. Um, so you might, must see a, a lot of use cases or a lot of applications. Is there anything where you, where you were saying it's something interesting or exotic that you um, haven't seen in a while that's not confidential, of course? 
Yeah. So we, because we work in uh, in in a number of like uh, industries, uh, we I get to see a lot of different use cases, and they're all cooler than the than the, the previous one. I find um, one of the big industries we're in is automotive. Uh, that shouldn't be surprising. Surprising. It's been going on for a little while. Like all the OEMs are trying to get uh, autonomous cars on the roads or uh, or ADAS, which is Advanced Driver Assistance Systems that are not fully autonomous, but uh, that are basically enhanced uh, cars, right? Um, so that requires um, a lot of uh, training data. Um, I like to think that uh, we're pretty much annotating the streets and the highways of the world today, right? Oh. <laughs> uh, and... Um, now, a few years ago, that that really meant just for us to to put bounding box around like stop signs and, and pedestrians. Mm -hmm. right? uh, but but today it's it's far more subtle, uh, and and we work a lot in in three D and three D uh, point clouds. Three D mm -hmm. point clouds are usually collected by lidar. So, um, as your uh, listeners might know, um, you know more and more cars are coming up with like uh, uh, lidars, at least in in the labs or in <laughs> as a, in the development centers. Uh, all all except we, Tesla, right? What's that? All except Tesla. Yeah, all except Tesla, exactly. But mm -hmm. uh, I mean, you know, we can make a bet that Tesla at some point will have to go to light yeah. or uh, yeah. yeah, but that's a conversation for another time. Uh, and um, and then then and today, yeah, your our annotating uh, agents they really need to identify uh, more subtle uh, objects and scenario. Uh, and it's actually very easy to do a terrible job at this. Um, mm -hmm. If you ask me to do it, you're going to have terrible training data. And we know that that translates directly to uh, wasted money and, and often to uh, uh, a bad model performance. But we have people who have been doing this for quite a while now. Uh, and, and their work is, I would call it almost a piece of, uh, uh, of art. Within the product team, uh, from time to time, we will share some of these uh, annotations from the 3D point clouds or sensor fusion when you have like a 3D point cloud, but you also have like reference cameras that go with it. So mm -hmm. it's kind of multiple modalities here. Uh, and we'll share them uh, again amongst themselves because uh, they're, they're just beautiful and we're in awe of the uh, detailed work and uh, expertise that's put um, into, uh, into that work. So, but if you don't have a, a context image, how can you annotate it? It's even for a human, very difficult to figure out what is what, no? So that's why we're talking about the sensor fusion these days and multiple okay. modalities. Right now, like the two modalities are, you know, uh, just uh, 2D cameras, for instance. So you can have like reference 2D cameras that are uh, calibrated with respect to the LiDAR itself. So it helps you navigate and understand the 3D world a lot better. Because if you don't understand what you're looking at, you can look at a camera pointing in that direction and, and see that, uh, you know, what you're looking at is a dog, for instance. Um, I actually suspect that we're going to be adding more and more uh, modalities. I know there's radar, but also maybe from other uh, stuff, maybe it's sound one day or audio might be uh, mm. uh, helpful helpful in, in understanding uh, what you're looking at. That's how we um, that's how we operate as humans, right? We use all of the modalities, all the senses to make sense of the world. We also need, use kind of like really quick predictive systems based on experience. And then we use a, a kind of a higher level contextual understanding of the world, which models uh, haven't been able to uh, to get to uh, yet uh, and and probably won't for for the foreseeable uh, f uh, uh, future until we, we hit something closer to AGI, right? Yeah. Yeah, so um, multiple data sources is definitely an issue. Uh, and I'm sure there, there will be more. And I'm thinking also, once the machine-to-machine uh, -machine communications are more uh, more like more common, this is also a data source that you might add at one point, maybe after the model, in order to verify the results. Um, oh, okay, cool. So you're saying uh, um, automotive is one of the fields where you where a lot lot is happening, and um, you see more, more and more in surprising applications. Absolutely, but there's other uh, other really exciting fields as well. That one that I particularly like is the uh, the agriculture agriculture field, mm -hmm. or the, uh, what we call the ag tech. Um, mm -hmm. I that's that's a field that's uh, um, that that's a field that's ripe for uh, for for benefiting from AI. And yes, the pun is intended here. Um, <laughs> and the reason why I'm really excited about it because it can have such a positive impact on the world. Um, right. The, the idea is to use computer vision systems, like uh, whether they're mounted on drones that are flying over the, the fields, 
or on tractors uh, or the machinery uh, on the fields uh, directly, uh, what they do is that they uh, try to identify local issues with the crop before they become really, uh, really problematic and become global issues, right? So mm -hmm. imagine systems that can uh, tell a weed from a crop, for instance. Early on, right, right before before it becomes a problem, and that can eliminate that that that, that weed uh, with some targeted uh, herbicide uh, delivery system, right. Mm -hmm. So there's really an opportunity to reduce our use of uh, herbicides and pesticides by like orders of magnitudes, and and that really excites me. And and what I really love about this industry, I've been at Sama for two and a half years now, is the progress, the rate of progress. It's going at a oh. lightning speed. Uh, we used to see models that were not performing very well, uh, you know, 18 months ago, uh, and today they're they're doing a, they're doing like impressive uh, stuff. So um, I'm really looking forward to where this industry is going because I think it's a perfect match for uh, for for AI and 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 seeing a, a quick uh, return on on investment uh, and changing oh, yeah. the world. I, I, I guess the the economical pressure is also big to to improve yields and and grow more and feed the feed the world really. So while yeah, reducing, sure. uh, while reducing toxic uh, yeah. herbicides, right? And I find it also interesting because, um, I mean, I'm obviously in, in the European Union right now and there's a big um, skepticism towards um, GMOs. And if you don't have GMOs, there's not so many other possibilities to increase yield. And this could be one of them that's really harmless. Yeah. Uh, where it can grow more. Absolutely. Yeah. One of the trends we're seeing in this uh in this domain is really interesting. We we used to be purely um, doing uh, annotation annotations from scratch, right? For uh, creating what really uh, raw training data that then would be used for for training the models. Uh, but then these models started to become like better and better, <laughs> right? Uh -huh. and, and today we have some workflows where instead of sending us uh, the the just the raw data unannotated, they're selling send, sending us pre-annotated uh, data from their models. And all we do is correct uh, the errors. So we move from what we call a pure annotation workflow to, mm -hmm. um, to a validation workflow, which means we can go through a lot more volume. And we're also focusing on what humans are good at, whereas like correcting these errors, uh, identifying the edge cases, providing uh, insights and, and context at, at, the, at the data that we're seeing. And, and this is another advantage is that it's kind of a form of insurance or assurance for for our clients that their model is doing the right thing and it's not going to you know go uh, <laughs> and spit out stuff that uh, uh, could be really problematic. Oh yeah, yeah. Hmm. Interesting. I mean, um, obviously, da data labeling um, uh, was a huge thing in, in pre and still is obviously in, the, in previous years and still is. Um, but especially in computer vision, a few years ago, we saw the emergence of synthetic data. Um, well, maybe maybe for context for everyone, synthetic data is uh, is the idea of uh, creating data sets synthetically. Um, in computer vision, that's mainly done with, uh, with graphics engines like an Unreal Engine or so. So basically, using computer games to create data sets. Um, how is it a, a threat to labeling companies, or is it an opportunity? Is it maybe something you offer yourself? And and yeah, do you, do you see that replacing uh, data sets um, or more augmenting them? So. I love this question because <laughs> uh, you guys are an opportunity to put to rest this this notion that it's really a threat to our business. Obviously, like it could become a threat if all we're doing is trying to like compete against you know model predictions of existing models or generative AI models that are spin spinning out or like generating uh, synthetic data or other or other means of, of generating synthetic data. Right? If that's what we were doing. Then yeah, it would be a real a real problem. Yeah. But the reality is that our business is is different, right? Um, I like I like to describe our business in very uh, simple simple terms, right? So I think we're in the business at Sama at least, and I I, I think we're completely different from you know Amazon uh, Turk for instance. Mm -hmm. uh, our our business is is about downloading basically skills and knowledge that resides in human brains, in our case, like our annotators, into training data in the form of, of annotation. And that then that training data is used for uh, training a model that can reproduce those skills. 
But that's a never ending process for us because when the model has like learned those skills and is able to reproduce them, think of YOLO out of the box, for instance, right? Well, then it's no longer a competitive edge for our, our clients and they need to move on to uh, a higher level of, uh, of work, which is semantic, semantically uh, more uh, challenging. Yeah. Uh, uh, so we can leverage, obviously, these newly produced technologies, such as uh, YOLO, for instance, or like those foundation models, or, or I'm thinking of SAM, for instance, uh, mm -hmm. even LLMs in what we do. Um, we can leverage to help like that next phase, which is to uh, really uh, get the models to, to perform on maybe uh, more subtle data, more rare data, um, and kind of have all the heavy lifting done by and, and run of the mill heavy lifting done by these models, these, these, these new models, think of YOLO, for instance, uh, but then free our agents to, and let them focus on edge cases, on insights, on identify where the errors are, where the model is, is not doing well yet, and finding more data that can actually um, help once annotated again in the next training phase of, of, uh, of the model. Uh, and our annotators are actually great at doing this, right? Mm -hmm. uh, Think of uh, pulling, for instance, an image uh, uh, of a motorcycle on the road, but that motorcycle is carrying another mo motorcycle on top, <laughs> right? Well, obviously that's a rare event, maybe a little less rare in, in, in East Asia, but like in North America, that's, yeah. that's not gonna happen. But your model still needs to be able to identify that one. And for a human, it's pretty easy to understand what's going on, right? Um, our clients won't see it. They won't know that they've missed it. Because they're yeah. not looking at their data, um, and and the difference between an average model or, that offers absolutely no competitive edge and a great model is going it's going to be the ability to deal with these use cases, mm -hmm. um, and the ability or, and the assurance that that, that they're not going to fail in a catastrophic way, right? And that's what we are more and more focusing at uh, at uh, at Sama. Obviously, it requires experts annotators but that's what we have um our annotators stay with us for uh way longer than uh, than the average in the industry which means we have multiple opportunities for training them and it means that they built um a lot of experience as well in, in I, I, it's, it's also cool because you're you're um the people that you mentioned your annotators in east africa you're upskilling them and um and they will have less of a risk to uh, fall between the cracks once these models get better and so on. And it's it's not only about labeling anymore. Um, yeah, exactly. And and it is our challenge. It's always to stay a step or two ahead of the state of the art models. Mm -hmm. But I think that that's a never ending race until we get to AGI. But I think we're kind of far from it. Uh, yeah. Our challenge is how can we train them faster and faster? Because that's something that's happening. And the tasks that they're doing are you know, becoming uh, more challenging, obviously. Like I said, putting a bounding box around a stop sign, well, that's kind of easy. Now, trying to identify a small object on a road in a 3D point cloud and knowing and, and providing like detailed attributes about this object, that's a skill that is a little harder. It can still be yeah. learned, but it's a little harder. Yeah. Um, that, that makes me think of... Um... I mean, uh, responsible AI, trustworthy AI is becoming more and more and more important. I know it is in the security industry, and we're usually a few years late to these kind of things. Um, and a big part of it is, um, is is data sets, right? I mean, one thing how you treat data within the organization, but obviously also bias. Um, do you think there is a part there for for a company like yours um, to help with this, to to look at what's how balanced is your data set, how what's the bias in the data set? Yeah, absolutely. So we started with like uh, the non-threat of, uh, uh, but this is obviously absolutely a, 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 an opportunity for for us as well, uh, and it's a great match to uh, what we're capable of doing because uh, at Sama we can actually pinpoint exactly which annotator has annotated what, right? So there's mm -hmm. a name I can actually email them, I can Slack them, I know who that is, right? Out of the yeah. thousands, thousands of annotators, and that's going to be important in the years to come when you know. Uh, companies are going to be responsible for the whole stack 
and legally mm -hmm. responsible for the whole stack of the machine learning development cycle, right? Starting with at the, the very bottom, which is the data, which is probably the most important one, right? Um, so if we could prove that uh, we uh, have the right skilled people, that we know exactly who's annotating uh, what at what time, uh, that's a huge benefit. And it's something that most of the industry is not capable of doing today. Like try to figure out who was annotating, you know, your your data uh, from uh, the uh, uh, Mechanical Turk, for instance. That's an extreme example, but there's a number of other players uh, as well that would never be able to do that or are not ready to be as transparent. Because in some cases, for instance, the same email address is used by multiple people uh, uh, for doing the work and they have no idea who's doing what. Uh, that's not the case for us. So, so we might be one day, and it's a, it, it, it's a, it's a, you know, maybe a, a, a an objective for us to be able to, to certify really the the data that uh, that we uh, that we process. Oh, that's that's interesting, because um, to be honest, as a company, it's kind of hard to um, to squeeze out the resources, like to, to have a person just just focus on this. Because uh, there's always the next feature around the corner and there's backlogs and so on. So while it's super important, it's always very hard internally to really make sure that this is happening. So having maybe a company outside that's focusing on this might be really helpful to, um, yeah, to make sure that this happens. Absolutely. Hmm. Um, okay, cool. So, um, so definitely, I, it seems like um, synthetic data enabling companies, or at least SAMA, are not, um, are not in competition to each other. Um, but rather it's a, it's an evolving field. That's what I understand. Yeah. So I would um, say just to add a little bit of nuance to that, cause I think it's a, it's a topic I'm fascinated mm -hmm. about and it's very, um, very apropos right now. Um, the challenge is to actually maybe convince our clients that it is not a, a competition to what we do, right? We do leverage these tools just as much as they do. Uh, we love foundation models. We love, you know, those latest uh, models and generative AI models. And we use them whenever it makes sense to uh, accelerate our processes and to also kind of offload all the work that doesn't need to be done by humans to those automated uh, systems so that our humans can really focus on what they're, they're great at, which is anything outside of what those models have learned so far, but that still needs to be transferred to the models over the next uh, few months, few years, depending on the timelines that our clients have. Uh, again, I always see it as a transfer of information from humans to, to models, and, and that's gonna be going on for, for a while. So for instance, in, in, in the field of synthetic data, we may be able to annotate a few things uh, by hand, uh, and then after that, use that to, uh, and, and the latest models in, 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 uh, in creating the synthetic data, to, to create even better synthetic data that is already labeled. But the, the core of it is still uh, starting from uh, human uh, labeled uh, data. Because, I mean, yeah. Just because, I, I, because generative AI can't learn what it hasn't learned, right? It's not learning on its own. It's just learning from the data it's seen so far. And it, it's got holes in its understanding of the world. And that's what we can provide, like filling the gaps in these in these in in those holes. Yeah. I, I, and as you're saying, there will be gaps for a long time before it really is perfect. Absolutely. So, uh, my personal experience with synthetic data, I mean, we have been uh, looking at um, like using Unreal Engine and so on. And it has very limited applications if you don't augment it with, uh, with GANs or, or other uh, means to make it more realistic. Uh, and it also requires a lot of work. So in the end, you end up just using it to augment your existing data set because it's, uh, yeah, you cannot just fully rely on it. Mm -hmm. uh, but you, you mentioned uh, generative AI quite a bit. Uh, obviously, it's a big trend of the year. Um, this year, LLMs. Last year, maybe more in the, in the area of computer vision. Um, since we're here more about computer vision, so um, what are the uh, the big things, the big developments that you see in generative AI in computer vision in, in image processing? Yeah, I think we're really seeing um, well, a lot of things uh, happening uh, all at once, um, and we are seeing, like from a pure business point of view, like some clients mentioning now that part of their training data is data that has been synthetically uh, generated. Mm -hmm. What I find really interesting is um, two things. First is 
they a lot of our clients haven't come to the realization that even though this data might be synthetically generated, it still needs to be validated by humans. Because otherwise, you might have uh, data that you're sure is of, of great quality, and when you inspect it very quickly, you see that it might be work. It might work for 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 training data, but the ultimate uh, the, the ultimate validation of this is 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 by humans in the human world, right? Uh, otherwise, the synthetic data might just work on models that work on synthetic data, but they don't work on real data. So mm -hmm. <laughs> that's the first realization. And I think it's it's funny. I'm seeing it like in client calls where all of a sudden when we kind of explain this whole process, they go like, yeah, you're right. We, we have nothing to actually validate all of this. So mm -hmm. um, I'm sure that won't be the case in a year from now because things are going very, very fast. But today, that's the uh, uh, that's where we're at. That's the first thing I, I find it uh, uh, super interesting. And, and the, the second is, um, it just means really that the, the proportion, if you think of you know, your data as a, as a whole, your training data, your validation data, your test data, your monitoring data as a whole, there are proportions of each of these different types of data that are completely shifting right now. We used to have you know, 100% was training data before models were getting in production. And then we, out of this training data, maybe we were using 10% for validation and 10% for test. This was like, you know, what used to be done. But it was very static in the sense that you would start with that, you would train your model, look at your validation data to, to decide when to stop training, and then use a, a blind test data to see the performance of your model. Okay. Today, these proportions are completely shifting. There's new types of data that are coming in because they're a really dynamic system, especially when you're thinking about uh, um, uh, models in production. So today we're seeing a lot more synthetic data being part of that 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 uh, that pie of uh, that whole pie of uh, of data, and that is probably be growing. Synthetic data can be cheap and can be used, you know, for 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 volume. The training data. Uh, the, sorry, the, um, the the human label data might be taking a, a smaller uh, uh, piece of the of the pie in proportion, but it is also your most important data because that's where the, the net new information that you're trying to to feed to your your model so that it learns it, it resides right. It won't reside in synthetic data. It's going to reside in the human labeled or human validated data. And then we're also seeing all these workflows where, um, I, I, I think I mentioned them before, where we are uh, feeding data to the models already using the predictions as a base for after that correcting them and through those validation workflows where annotators might be, um, you know, just making small corrections or big corrections, identifying the, the flaws, flaws with your model. Yeah, and I, I really like to point also that um, this real data and real annotated data is so important for validation and testing. So you don't run into a like um, self-fulfilling prophecy type of loop where you just get worse and worse over time. So this seems seems to me like it will remain important because the things you build are for the real world. It's not for the machines. So it has to work on the real data, not on the synthetic data. Exactly. That's, That's an interesting point. Put better than uh, I I did in this conversation. That's exactly Just repeating what you said. <laughs> Um, I guess in your in your area, you're not working with LLMs so much, right? We're not. I mean, we keep an eye on LLMs. Uh, we we have yeah, we have done a little bit of work uh, with um, you know in annotations in, in NLP. It's not the our, our core. Uh, um, it's not our core business. Mm -hmm. um, just because uh, part of the problem with LLMs is is because you need to support multiple languages, and right now we're mostly uh, in uh, East Africa. So you know, if it's not English, maybe we can do a little bit of French, and if it's not Swahili, uh, we run into uh, <laughs> a little bit more of a of a challenge, and we would rather like focus on our core expertise, which is computer vision. This being said, this being said. I mean, we are seeing uh, the beginning of a conversions between the modalities, right? There's models mm -hmm. now that use one modality as input, another one as output, or both as input and both as output. And I, I, I and I find that extremely interesting. So, for for instance, internally, we 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 leverage the the clip uh, model a lot, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so, for, for for your audience who doesn't know, a clip model is just a, a it's just a a model that allows you to to, to use uh, both a text uh, to use text basically um, to uh, that, that merges text and and uh, and uh, images um, to extract the maximum information, right? And um, what we use clip for is a similarity search on on images. 
Oh, um, really? And that has turned to be very, very helpful. So think of being able to, once we see an image that might be a little bit more challenging, uh, go through all our databases of images uh, that we've already annotated for that client to pull out the, the ones that are similar to uh, to train our, our, our agents or to guide them in, in the annotation. That's just one of multiple use cases of using similarity search uh, on, on clip, uh, clip embeddings in this case. Oh, okay. Very cool. We can also do it like, and because Clip uh, uh, allows for using, uh, you know, a text prompt, uh, we can also have our agents, uh, annotating agents, use uh, text to just look through all the images that we have so far. So it might I mean, be able yeah. to say, find a find a uh, find an image of a motorcycle on top of another motorcycle, and <laughs> and that will guide the search for for those uh, edge cases. Yeah, I mean, this is um. This is maybe a, a good segue to, uh, to to my industry, to the security industry, because obviously it would be an interesting use case to search through all the video surveillance data based on, on text, uh, which today might be uh, um, like um, in terms of compute power a little bit much, but uh, we might get to this at one point and it might be interesting. And the models themselves, they could create maybe a scene understanding and scene description where you have the complete description of a video in text form that's uh, also searchable through an LLM and um, yeah, interesting world. And I, I totally agree. I, it's really a trend that you see this multimodal models that support everything. So at, at one point it won't be so separate, separate and you stitch things together, which makes it also much more performant and, and fast if you can all put them into one model and don't have to run different models and then copy data between them and so on. This is how we work as humans, right? So if the yeah. AI is truly a true objective is to uh, reproduce uh, and, and go beyond human capabilities, um, that's definitely the way forward. Oh, yeah. Well, going beyond our capabilities. That's maybe a good, uh, that's maybe a good uh, ending point to this conversation. Um, yeah, thanks, Jerome. This was super interesting. Um, I have to point out that I, I found it so interesting because you have such a broad view. You're not in the specific uh, any specific application, but you see so many different things. So I found this super insightful. Are there any last words you want to leave uh, to our listeners? Uh, well, I thought this was really interesting as well. So thanks for having me uh, on. I, and um, no, last words. Yeah, I, I'm just as excited as anyone about uh, the AI uh, opportunities uh, uh, these days. I, I'm also kind of a, a, a tech a techno optimist that it's going to help us solve some of the big issues. Uh, it, it won't solve everything, right? Uh, I'm a techno optimist and not a not a techno utopian. But uh, I, I'm looking forward to to all these applications that are going to tackle like uh, global global warming, uh, you know, or, or, or even uh, uh, tackling extreme poverty. Uh, and I'm really looking forward to to the next few years. I think they're going to be super exciting. Cool. So no uh, robot uprising this year. <laughs> and only all, all the good stuff. Not on my watch. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Okay. Thank you, Jerome, again. This was very interesting. Thanks for coming and uh, for everybody else. Thank you for listening. Thanks.